Section One. John Helston, a student from London University, wants to know some information about a twenty-first conference. You'll hear a conversation between John and university staff. Now you have some time to look at questions one to five. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. University, good morning. Oh, good morning. Can you put me through to the School of Architecture, please? Certainly. School of Architecture, Professor Dawson's office. Oh, good morning. I was wondering if you could give me some information about the forthcoming Architecture Twenty First Conference, dates, enrolment procedures, costs, that sort of thing. Certainly. When exactly is the conference? Well, the conference runs for three days, from the eighteenth to the twentieth of October. Eighteenth to twentieth of October. Oh, good. I'll still be here then. And、uh, where exactly is it being held? Is it at the university, as in previous years? No, it's actually being held at the Pacific Hotel. We've rather outgrown the university conference facilities, so we've opted for this new venue. Right, Paradise Hotel. No, Pacific Hotel. Oh, right. And presumably we can get accommodation at the hotel. Yes, but you'll need to contact them direct to arrange that. I'll give you the number for hotel reservations. Have you got a pen ready? Yeah, go ahead. It's area code zero seven and then nine triple three double two double three. Okay, and what's the registration fee? Individual fees are three hundred dollars for the three days, or one hundred and twenty dollars a day if you only wanted to attend for one day. Are there any student concessions? Oh, sure. There's a fifty percent concession for students, and that's one hundred and fifty dollars for the three days, or sixty dollars a day. And am I too late to offer to give a talk? Oh, I'm pretty sure you've missed the deadline for that. Oh, really? But I've only just arrived here in Australia. Is there any way I could have a paper accepted? Well, you'd need to talk to Professor Dawson. He's the person organising the conference this year. I can put you through if you like. Oh yes, please. That'd be great. Oh, and、uh, can I just check the spelling of his name? Is that D A W S O N? Yes, that's correct. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen carefully and answer questions six to ten. Professor Dawson speaking. Oh, hello. My name is John Helston. I'm an architecture student at London University. I'm here in Australia for three months,、uh, looking at energy-saving house designs. Right. I'm interested in giving a talk on my research at the conference, but I believe I may have missed the deadline. Well, strictly speaking, you have. The closing date was last Friday. Oh no! But we may be able to include your paper if it fits into our program. But you'll have to be quick. Okay. What do I need to do? Send me an outline of your talk, and make sure you include an interesting title for the talk. Something to attract the delegates' attention. Okay, interesting title, right? The outline should be no more than three hundred words, though. Right. I should be able to keep it down to three hundred words, but would four hundred be okay? No, not really, because we have to print it in the proceedings, and we just don't have the space. Sure, I understand. And also, can you send me a short CV, the usual stuff, name, age, and qualifications, that sort of thing? Right. Include a brief CV. Actually, you can email it to me. That'd be quicker. Sure. What's your email address? Well, the best thing would be to send it to the conference administrative officer. The address is admin in lower case. You know, in small letters. Right. So that's a d m i n at. Uniconf. dot edu. dot au. Right. I'll do that straight away. Thank you very much. You've been very helpful. Okay. Well, we hope to see you in October then. 
That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. In this section, you'll hear a message left to John on how to look after the house. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 20. Now listen carefully to the message and answer questions 11 to 20. Hello John, welcome to the house. I'm really pleased that you can be here to look after my house while I'm away. Here are some things you need to know about the house. Important stuff like when the garbage is collected. In fact, let's start with the garbage, which is collected on Friday. Just write garbage on the calendar on the days they take it away. Put it out on Friday every week, that'll be Friday the 22nd, Friday the 29th and Friday the 5th. It's a really good service. The trucks are quiet and the service is efficient. The bin would be put outside of the house empty. It's a good idea to put it away quickly. This street can be quite windy. I once watched my next door neighbour chase her bin the whole length of the street. Every time she nearly caught up with it, it got away again. The waste paper will be collected this Tuesday. That's Tuesday the 19th. There's a plastic box full of paper in the front room. Please put it out on Tuesday. The truck will come during the day. If you don't mind collecting old newspapers and other paper and putting them in the box, I'll put it out when I come home. The paper people only come monthly. I have some things to give to charity in a box in the front room. Would you put it out on Monday the 25th, please? It's a box of old clothes and some bed linen which I've collected, plus a few other bits and pieces. The charity truck will come by during the day on the last Monday of the month. Like the paper people, it comes monthly. If you want to use the library, you'll find it on Darling Street. I've left my borrower's card near the telephone. It has a very good local reference section if you want to find out more about this city. The library is open from 9am to 5pm, Monday to Saturday. I'm sorry to say that we don't have a cleaner. Oh yes, filters. Would you please change the filters on the washing machine on the last week of the month, no matter which day? We find that the machine works much better if we change the filters regularly. The gas company reads the meter on the 30th, the last Saturday. I think that's all the information about our calendar of events. Well, John, I'm trying to think what else I should be telling you. As you know, I'm going to a conference in London. I hope to have a little time to look around. It's a great city. I do hope I manage to get at least some of the theatres and museums. I'm looking forward to all the things I have to do at the conference, too. I'm giving a paper on Tuesday the 26th, and there are a couple of exciting events planned later in the conference programme. I hope to meet up with an old teacher of mine at the conference. She taught English literature at my high school, and we've kept in touch through letters over the years. She now teaches at the University of Durham, and I'm really looking forward to seeing her again. By the way, I expect you're hungry after your trip. I've left a meal in the refrigerator for you. I hope you like cheese and onion pie. Would you do me a favour, please? I haven't had time to cancel an appointment. It was made a long time ago, and I forgot about it until this morning. It's with my dentist for a check-up on Thursday the 28th. Could you please call the dentist on 8162-525 and cancel the appointment for me? Thanks a lot, John. One last thing. When you leave the house, make sure the windows and doors are shut, and set the burglar alarm. The alarm code number is 9120. Have fun. I'll see you when I get back. This is your friend Martha, saying goodbye.
That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. In this section, you'll hear a conversation between Astrid and Henry about the lecture they've just heard. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 21 to 30. Henry, don't you think Dr. Adam's lecture was really very good? He could talk about the telephone directory and make it interesting. All his lectures are like that, Astrid. He's just one of those people. I wish we had him as our tutor. I bet you that he is very demanding, though. Boris is in his tutorial group and agrees that he is brilliant. But he puts them under a lot of pressure. Hmm. But don't you think that's good? Perhaps. Anyway, he's interesting and rather funny. Did you take lots of notes in the lecture? Yes, actually I did. In fact, several pages. I didn't think I had taken so many. I was that busy listening to what was being said that I didn't take many notes. Can I photocopy yours? I don't think that's such a good idea. You won't be able to read my handwriting. And sometimes I write them in English and sometimes in Arabic. Oh, let's have a look. Wow, your notes are so neat. Well, there's not much in Arabic. There is on this page. <laughs> yes, there is. Dr. Adams would be pleased to see this, especially given what he's talking about. Oh, don't you keep careful notes? Mm, sometimes. It depends on the lecture. I don't think I'll forget Adams' lecture today, but some of the details will fade. I type up everything afterwards, so you can have a copy then, and you can fill in anything I've missed. I'm not so good on the broader concepts. I'm better when it comes to detail. Just what Adams was talking about. Well, I am definitely a detail person. I need to have everything written down before I can get the concepts clear in my head. And I am the complete opposite. I find all the detail clutters up my mind, and I get very frustrated, which was just what he was on about. He mentioned a book he had written. He mentioned several. The one on space and the individual. Yes, called My Space. It's on the book list. Hmm, so it is. I think I'll get that out of the library, or get my own copy. Did you get what he said about spatial awareness? I didn't, really. Yes, it was fascinating. I can't be as eloquent as Adams was, but I know several people who are frighteningly intelligent but they have difficulty reading simple directions, even when getting to places that they know very well. I find that difficult to understand. Everyone learns the way to walk to the shops and things like that. You mean just the way people learn spelling? You know, people misspell words, make mistakes in countless areas of their lives, and going in the right direction is just the same. Remember what Adam said about the number of people who cannot tell left from right, north from south, and so on? Do you know which way is north? Um, it's that way. <laughs> you see, I couldn't have told you that. Really? I haven't a clue which way is which. That's why I'm always getting lost when I go out on my bike. And put me in a completely new place and I am totally lost. What about maps? Oh, I'm hopeless at reading them. But then you're brilliant at writing essays and getting all the ideas down in the right order. And I don't know where to start. Again, just what Adams was talking about. What we need to do is combine our skills. You teach me to cope with detail, and I'll teach you how to string concepts together. OK, we can do that. That is the end of section three.
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. In this section, you'll hear a lecture about Iron Age in Britain. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully to the message and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today I am going to introduce to you a special age in Britain, the Iron Age. People at that time, you may be surprised to hear that, seem close to the men and women of today, because archaeologists discovered that they tried to vary their diet, improve their homes, and follow fashions. The period known as the Iron Age lasted in Britain for about 800 years, from 750 BC to 43 AD. There had been several dramatic changes by the end of the Iron Age, including coinage, wheel-thrown pottery, etc. People had started to live in larger and more settled communities. Furthermore, because of the differences in climate and geography, Someone living in Yorkshire or Ireland would have eaten different food, worn different clothing, and lived in different housing conditions from someone living in southern Britain. Caesar commented that Britain was a land of small farms, and this has been proven by the archaeological evidence. Since Iron Age society was primarily agricultural, it is safe to presume that the daily routine would have revolved around the maintenance of the crops and livestock. Small farmsteads were tended by and would have supported isolated communities of family or extended family size. They produced enough to live on and a little extra to exchange for commodities that the farmers were unable to provide for themselves. For those farms, harvested crops were stored in either granaries that were raised from the ground on posts or in bell-shaped pits two to three metres deep. Some 4,500 of these storage pits have been found within the hill fort interior at Danebury in Hampshire, and if they were all used to store crops, this would have essentially made the site one large fortified granary. Although the archaeological evidence shows that cattle and sheep would have been the most common farm animals, it is known that pigs were also kept. The animals would have aided the family, not only with heavy farm labour, in the case of the cattle, such as the ploughing of crop fields, but also as a valuable form of wool or hide and food products. Horses and dogs are also observed in the archaeological evidence from both faunal remains and artefacts. Horses were used for pulling two- or four-wheeled vehicles, carts, chariots, while dogs would have assisted in the herding of the livestock and hunting. Besides agriculture and stock raising, the architecture in Iron Age is also worth mentioning. A very well-preserved settlement has been discovered at the site of Chiselster in Cornwall. It was made up of individual houses of stone with garden plots. In Wessex, the typical building on a settlement would have been the large round house. All of the domestic life would have occurred within this. The main frame of the round house would have been made of upright timbers, which were interwoven with coppiced wood, usually hazel, oak, ash, or pollarded willow, to make wattle walls. This was then covered with a daub made of clay, soil, straw, and animal manure that would weatherproof the house. The roof was constructed from large timbers and densely thatched. The main focus of the interior of the house was the central open hearth fire. This was the heart of the house to provide cooked food, warmth, and light. Because its importance within the domestic sphere, 
the fire would have been maintained twenty-four hours a day. Beside the fire may have stood a pair of fire dogs, such as those found at Baldock in Herefordshire, or suspended above it a bronze cauldron held up by a tripod and attached with an adjustable chain. The ordinary basic cooking pots would have been made by hand, from the local clay, and came in varying rounded shapes, occasionally with simple incised decorations. As for eating, bread would have been an important part of any meal, and was made from wheat and barley. The dough would have then been baked in a simple clay-domed oven, of which evidence has been found in Iron Age houses. The barley and rye could also have been made into a kind of porridge. In addition to this, the grain was also fermented to make beer, and the surface foam that formed was scraped off and used in the bread-making process. The interior of the house was an ideal place for the drying and preservation of food. Smoke and heat from the constant fire would have smoked meat and fish, and would have dried herbs and other plants perfectly. Salt was another means of preserving meat for the cold winter months, but this was a commodity that could not be made at a typical settlement. Well, you can see that Iron Age people lived a decent life, didn't they? I'm going to introduce their culture and leisure time next time. Thank you. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.